I'd like to present you James Hugh. Dr. Hugh served as the Executive Director of the World Transhumanist Association, which has since changed its name to Humanity Plus from 2004 to 2006, and currently serves as the Executive Director of the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which he founded with Nick Boston. Please welcome Dr. Hughes. Thank you. So, this is a picture of my younger, thinner self. Um, and uh, I put it up there because, for me, this dialogue of religion and transhumanism, of which I see this cosmism uh, conversation to be a part of, um, has been going on a long time. I been, became a Buddhist when I was a teenager and, and a monk eventually, and um, have became a transhumanist probably about 25 years ago. Um, and so it's been something I've been thinking and writing a lot about. And I want to do three things during this talk. Um, first, I want to talk about the importance of the religion and transhumanism dialogue and the, its inescapability. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the areas in which there is friction, but also potential compatibilities between uh, religious points of view and, and the transhumanist point of view. And then dig deep on moral enhancement as a particular topic where I think there can be mutually beneficial conversation between the religious and the transhumanists. So the first place to start, I think, is the acknowledgement that a lot of transhumanist ideas are ancient religious ideas or ancient mythological ideas. As soon as we became capable of symbolic thought, uh, as, as upright apes, we probably then started to think about wouldn't it be great if we could get rid of hunger? Wouldn't it be great if we could stop killing each other? Wouldn't it be great if I could live a lot longer? If I could be healthier? If I, didn't, if I wasn't covered with lice and boils? Um, and these aspirations for greater health, for, uh, for transcendent, so transcending the conditions, the limitations of, of our lives, uh, became reflected in mythological ideas. I'm sorry, I'm standing right in the way for you. Um, became reflected in mythological ideas about perfect cities, heavens, um, uh, ancient per perfect pasts, uh, and the capacity of the body to achieve uh, immortality through religious practices um, and potentially after death. But what happened about two, three hundred years ago was that this uh, school of thought a wide and diverse school of thought began to develop in Europe of the ideas of the Enlightenment, a, a complex interconnected set of uh, ideas about science and empiricism, um, and ideas about politics, and ideas about the self, uh, which uh, we broadly refer to as the Enlightenment, and there are many different flavors of it, and transhumanism is a kind of a reflection of the rationalism and techno-optimism, um, and there are some transhumanists who veer more to the left wing of the Enlightenment and some who veer more to the right wing of the Enlightenment. If you go back and look at the kind of interesting mix in the cosmist history of socialist ideas in with some of the techno-optimism, also reflected in the history of transhumanist ideas, for instance in England where Haldane uh, was one of the early transhumanists and also a Marxist. Um, at any rate, these, these, this, this slurry of ideas that uh, gets reflected in various ways is what modern transhumanism is. It's these ancient religious aspirations reflected and manifested through the idea of human technological and scientific mastery. Um, and so from that point of view, I see religion as a terrain of struggle for these Enlightenment ideas that I'm a partisan for. Um, I don't see religion as an enemy, and certainly a lot of the original Enlightenment thinkers didn't see religion as an enemy, and many of them were religious in their own way. They were enemies of fundamentalism, they were enemies of religious persecution uh, often, but they uh, saw, they believed in a, in a deist God, they believed in a, that you'd be able to understand um, our religious purpose by investigating nature. And whether that's the particular manifestation today, there are many different ways in which I think religion can be seen as a, as a terrain in which Enlightenment ideas are having more and less progress. I mean, this Pope is better than the last one, partly because we like some of the things that he's saying that are more enlightened. Um, uh, you know, when uh, a church decides that it's going to start per performing gay marriages, that's progress from an Enlightenment point of view. So 
Uh, even though many transhumanists are atheists or secular, about two-thirds of them, I've done a lot of surveys of transhumanists and asked them about this, um, and in the most recent survey I did, uh, about 60% said they were secular or atheist, but about 24% said that they were religious or spiritual in some way, and, they, and there are transhumanists around the world representing many different religious points of view. Uh, Panpsychism has started to appear as a phrase that some are beginning to describe themselves with. Uh, Unitarians, Buddhists, Protestants, and so forth. Chris Benick uh, just started the Christian Transhumanist Association, which is going to gangbusters. So there obviously are people, more people like me, who think that there is a compatibility between their particular spirituality and transhumanist ideas. And that cosmism, of course, is one example of this. Uh, an example with a, uh, an interesting mix, uh, at least traditionally in Russia, orth uh, Russian Orthodox views and some of these transhumanist ideas. I think there's also a demographic inescapability of this conversation in that um, many transhumanists, uh, the secular transhumanists, uh, believe that atheism, secularism is going to uh, conquer the world. Unfortunately, secular folks don't have a lot of kids. And religious folks have lots of kids, in by comparison. And so uh, Pew here has predicted the growth and decline of various religious groups. Muslims are supposed to increase their proportion of the world's population. Christians pretty much stay the same. And the unaffiliated and atheists and seculars are supposed to decline because we just don't breed fast enough. Um, and most folks take, take on the religious views of their parents. Now, if there is a great secular awakening, then of course that could change, but it doesn't seem to be happening quite yet. And another thing to say there is that as a consequence, when and if the singularity or all these changes that we're talking about come, most people in the world are gonna see them through the lens of their religious beliefs. They're going to try to interpret the, the import, the ethical significance, the eschatological significance, through their own religious worldviews, and we have to engage with that conversation. So I want to talk about three areas where we can engage. One is uh, views of metaphysics, views of eschatology, and views of soteriology. So at metaphysics, nature of God, the soul, eschatology, where we came from, where we're going, and soteriology, what does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be saved? So metaphysics, um, I would argue, have argued uh, in my book Citizen Cyborg, that one of the central ideas of the Enlightenment and of uh, transhumanist ethics is the notion that we are, that there is no supernatural essence that, uh, that gives meaning to being a human being, um, that it's the subjectivity of consciousness that gives us meaning and that that subjectivity, as has already been discussed in various ways here, uh, could be reflected, it's, in, it, it's substrate independent, it could be reflected in other uh, modalities, in silicon and so forth. Um, it, it's very interesting, if you go back to John Locke's reflection on personhood that originally led to one of the kind of key strains of thought in the Enlightenment about personhood, uh, what he would originally put forward as a speculation was, what does God have to do at the judgment to bring us back uh, to judge us, right? Because he doesn't necessarily need to bring back all the atoms that you were made up of when you died. Um, all he really needs to do, Locke speculated, was bring back your memories. Because if he doesn't bring back your memories, and then he judges you on the basis of the things that you've done, you know, how unfair is that? At least he has to bring back your memories and then you'll remember what you did and whether you're a good or bad person. Um, and so if it's just our memories and not actually the body that is our personhood, then perhaps that leads in a different uh, set of consequences. And so that idea, I think, is very different from a traditional uh, dualist spirit, spiritual idea, supernatural idea. Um, and it is part of the reason why transhumanists and religious folks have difficult discussions about, for instance, robots and um, animals, animal uplift, the moral significance of our relationship to other species, and so forth. Um, a lot of religions have very specific ideas about how human beings are supposed to come into the world and how they're supposed to leave it. So if you think that, you know, um, someone's going to reincarnate in a certain way, uh, and that they have to be prayed over for seven days, uh, uh, you know, their body, then maybe you're going to get squeamish about organ transplantation or cryonics or some of the other things that people propose. If you think that um, you only get the 
the good kind of soul if you're made in a you know, missionary position by a married uh, mother and father and that in vitro fertilization just doesn't do the same thing, then you're going to be very squeamish about genetic modification and assisted reproduction and so forth. So there's uh, you know, places where we have this discussion as well. Uh, personally, I don't think immortality should be, you know, this is one of the places where I'm squeamish myself about the religious uh, transhumanist dialogue or, or cosmism. So personally, I don't like the term immortality. Um, in the first place, Buddhists don't really believe that you exist in the, at all. Um, you know, you're just kind of, you're an illusion. Um, that once you accept that you're an illusion, then you can kind of transcend this attempt to hold on to life. But um, the notion of immortality, unless we figure out how to escape the heat death of the universe, at least, uh, seems a little bit uh, strange. But if you look at uh, the relative acceptability of transhumanist ideas, in Western uh, religious context, uh, specifically Christian, Judaism and, and Islam is still too early to say in many cases, but um, at least from Christian reflection on transhumanism, versus everything from about India to Japan, um, there's a lot more uh, possibility for a dialogue in the East. Um, and maybe they're already so transhumanist that they don't need transhumanism, because transhumanism is kind of, kind of defined by whether you need it or not uh, to, to argue against other points of view. But you know, you look at um, the Buddhist, Hindu Buddhist idea that we're all on some kind of cycle of evolution, and sometimes we're going to be animals, and sometimes we're going to be gods, and sometimes and eventually we can achieve uh, transcendent states and you know, live in a bodiless realm. And uh, that's a very you know transhumanist set of speculations. Not to mention that they're talking about it in billions cycles and you know the gods fly in on their moon discs and zap you with their love rays so there's a, there's a kind of science fictional aspect to Hindu Buddhist uh, cosmology that is consistent or transhumanist can get that Ganesha here is his dad accidentally cut off his head and just plopped a, an elephant head on to make up for it and you know, it sounds very tra transhumanist idea to me um, it's a very interesting question in this dialogue about you know, the Christians often get worried that uh, the transhumanist ideas are playing God and that it's some form of hubris. And if you actually believe in an omniscient, an omnipotent God, can you be hubristic? Is hubris actually a problem? And the theologian Ted Peters has pointed this out, that hubris is actually only a problem if you believe that God can be challenged by man, if you believe that God's up in, in Mount Olympus and that, that you, attempting to become a transhumanist, godlike creature, are, are storming up the mountain to take away uh, you know, Zeus's thunderbolts, then yes, hubris is a problem. But if you believe in an omniscient and omnipotent God, then everything that you're doing has to be part of some kind of plan. You're, you know, if you try to achieve immortality, you're not actually going to interfere with that God's ability to call you before judgment. You're just going to be alive when it happens. So um, uh, hubris is not really a problem from a monotheistic point of view. And I think there's an interesting dialogue and that the Mormons have explicitly engaged in and that Russian Orthodox uh, thought also touches on in the idea of theosis. What does it mean to be imago Dei, in the image of God? What does it mean to attempt to partake of a godlike nature through your religious practice. And for Russian Orthodox, you know, sanctification actually does mean that you begin to partake of the divinity of Christ. And then the Mormons became even more explicit is that you become a god and you get to rule your own planet as a god. Some religious uh, Christians um, object to transhumanism on the grounds that it's a neo uh, Gnostic heresy. So Gnosticism, Gnostics were people who hated the body and wanted to transcend the evil flesh. Um, and there are certainly some uh, transhumanists who talk that way about you know, getting rid of the meat puppet and, um, and transcending into the substrate independent immortal forms. And then there are transhumanists who are perfectly happy with the body, just want to perfect the body, and, and maybe that's a heresy too, body worship of some kind. Um, and I think that for many things, uh, for me, it results back to what is expressed in the serenity prayer, which is, that we need to have the serenity to accept things that can't be changed. We need to have the courage to change the things that can be changed. And we need to have the wisdom to know the difference. Now for me, Buddhism is all about the serenity part. It's about the serenity of, of accepting sickness, aging, and death. But it's not the serenity of standing in the middle of the road and letting a bus hit you. 
right? Buddha, Buddha never said that you had to stand in the middle of the road. He said, get out of the road. Um, and transhumanism is about the courage and the imagination to figure out what we can change, right? And so we need to figure out how, the, that balance, um, how we can, what, what aspects of human nature and human condition we can change, and there will always be things we can't. There's only going to be so much, uh, you know, oceanside property. There's going to be there's going to be unrequited love in the future. There are going to be things that we're going to have to have serenity about, but it may not actually be death in the way that we currently understand it. Some things like that may be changeable. Eschatology. So, uh, what's the future of the human race? Obviously, cosmism is all about a certain kind of eschatological vision, which you've heard some today. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a commonplace now that um, transhumanist ideas about singularity are basically a secular version of the rapture and, uh, and you know, the, the second coming and so forth. Um, and both in its apocalyptic dimensions, worries about the Terminator scenario, or in its uh, more millennialist versions, you know, Rick Kurzweil's uh, Lana will fall from heaven once the good robots come and things like that. So, um, but I think as, as uh, Julio pointed out, there are ways in which the transhumanist vision is not only about eschatology, is not only kind of rapture, a, a secular rapture, but it quickly uh, becomes an explicitly religious idea. So Julio referenced uh, the simulation hypothesis, hypothesis, the notion that we could all be living in the mind of God. There's there are folks like Michio Kaku who's um, speculated that we might be able to escape the heat death of the universe if we can figure out how to create pocket universes and, and migrate into them. Um, Tipler uh, was the guy who's been referenced as imagining what it would take to uh, recreate all uh, dead humans and non-humans in the universe um, on the skin of a massive black hole that would have a certain immortal quality to it. and so very religious idea hit for him, explicitly religious transhumanist idea. Um, Wolfram's idea that the universe is an intelligent computer, and then we extrapolate that to some kind of panpsychism, or if it's not panpsychic now, maybe it'll be panpsychic in the future when we convert all baryonic matter into computronium and everything is running, you know, godlike intelligence. Um, these ideas become very quickly, you know, just through kind of secular speculation, they become religious ideas. So, uh, as was referenced, I think, in Wendell's talk, who, who referenced the idea that um, uh, smug atheists um, should basically read more science fiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did that. That's good. Uh, it's certainly true. You read enough science fiction, you begin to wonder, you know, maybe sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. Maybe, we, maybe the aliens, the solution to the Fermi paradox is the aliens are all around us and we just don't recognize them that. You're soaking in it. So, um, so soteriology is the third area where we can have this conversation. And this is ideas about what it means to be a good person, what it means to have good character to become saved. And uh, I think that the mutual dialogue around moral enhancement is one in which we can do things for the religious uh, thought about this, and that they can do things for us. Um, I came to this speculation partly because I started thinking more about uh, David Pierce's um, ideas about abolishing suffering, and he's written the hedonistic imperative. Uh, he's a hedonic utilitarian, and he argues <coughs> that uh, Part of transhumanism, part of public policy, should be that we come up with ways to jack everybody's uh, pleasure up to 11, and that we could all be motivated by gradients of bliss. And for a Buddhist, this uh, sounds a note of alarm, because one of the explicit warnings in Buddhism is about getting trapped in blissful states. Um, you know, one of the ideas about why it's good to be born a human being as opposed to a god is that when you're in heavens, uh, that everything's happy for 10,000 years, and you don't think about the Dharma, um, and then you get reborn into the hells, and you're there for 10,000 years, and you can't think about the Dharma because you're suffering so much. It's only when you're a human being that you have the kind of right mix of emotional stuff to make progress, spiritual progress. 
And so this notion that uh, we're going to uh, be able to become the land of the lotus eaters and jack all of our uh, pleasure centers up to 11, uh, it sounds like the wrong path from that point of view. And it's a long debate in, in, in the history of philosophy, the debate between Hedonia and eudaimonia. Eudaimonia being uh, uh, an Aristotelian notion of what it means to be a good person, which is basically about flourishing and the development of character and moral rectitude as opposed to just having a pleasurable life. <laughs> it's not doing it. Um, okay, so the moral enhancement argument. The first part of the moral enhancement argument is that we are too weak to be good. And I don't think that a lot of religious folks actually have uh, a big problem with this uh, claim. The notion that we, dip, we have different moral capacities um, and that some people have great burdens that they struggle with of uh, compulsions and addictions and, and things like that and um, you know that some have to work harder than others to be good. This is a picture of a monk doing a, a meditation practice about the decomposition of the body. If you look at the Buddhist scriptures, um, one of the things that it recommends is if you have a particular problem with being attached to the body, you can do this meditation. If you have a particular problem with being attached to uh, lustful looking at women, you can meditate on the fact that they're full of pus and shit and blood and then overcome your lustful thoughts that way. Uh, if you have a problem with hate, you can do compassion meditation. So there's a kind of diagnostic protocol for what your character flaws are and how to work through them within Buddhism. There's a contemporary uh, psychological slash philosophical movement called Situationism, which argues that um, really character is pretty much an illusion. If you put anybody in the right situation, you put them in Abu Ghraib, you put them in a prison, that anybody would uh, end up, no matter how courageous you thought they were, anyone would end up overwhelmed by social circumstances. So different ways of framing this notion. We have different capacities for moral uh, behavior and sentiment, and, uh, and a lot and often we can be overwhelmed by circumstance. When will he die? Okay, thank you. Um, the other side of that is that we're too powerful to be bad. And this is the key argument in this book, uh, The Need for Moral Enhancement, Unfit for the Future, uh, Savalesco and Person's book. Um, they argue that because of the proliferation of powerful technologies, which will super empower small groups and individuals to create catastrophic damage in the world, um, that we basically have a moral imperative for obligatory moral enhancement. Now, I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> they, they basically make uh, the argument, and uh, it's an interesting argument to, to have. Uh, but um, the, at least, I think most of us want to be good, and I think we have an obligation to encourage one another to be good, and I'll get, return to that at the end. Um, I'm not prepared yet to say that we have an obligation to force everybody to take the goodness pill because some, some people might end up being terrorists or something like that. But um, that is an argument that is being made. So this is Savalescu, and that's John Harris. And part of their argument over the, about moral enhancement in the pages of Bioethics Journals over the last six years has been about oxytocin versus reason. <laughs> that Savalescu wants to give everybody oxytocin so they become nicer. And John Harris wants to make everybody smarter, give them cognitive enhancement pills so that they can reason better and get to morality that way. And it, to me, to my ears, it just sounds such a silly debate because it's like, hello, I know you have paid, not paid any attention to virtue ethics because you considered it reactionary Catholic nonsense, um, as I did for a long time as well. But uh, Aristotle, the Buddha, uh, Catholic thinkers, uh, any religious tradition basically has uh, wrestled with the fact that it's in its extreme and that developing a mature moral character requires the co-entrainment of many virtues at the same time, the wisdom to know when to be courageous and when not to be courageous and so on and so forth. So the simultaneous entrainment of virtue uh, is, I think, something that we can, that, that the religious uh, part of the conversation can give back to the moral enhancers, you know, to uh, help them understand what really is required. This is a model that I'm working with for the book that I'm writing about this, of the different kinds of virtues. And this, of course, is one huge problem with the issue of virtue uh, 
in general and with moral enhancement is um, that every system of thought has its own set of virtues. You know, Aristotle Lot 25, and, uh, and the Buddha has you know, between six and 10, depending on what tradition you look at, and they're all very idiosyncratic. You know, some of the Buddhist virtues are things about meditative states that aren't reflected at all in other systems of virtues. Some traditions of virtue, you know, the, the virtue of dying a noble death in, in battle, of you know, ancient Greek ideas of virtue don't correspond to modern ideas of virtue at all. So trying to boil this down and look for the commonalities is part of the struggle. And I think part of what we can do for the religious part of this dialogue is that the neuro social neuroscience is beginning to inform the actual understanding of the way that virtue works for human beings in ways that could then inform how the religious think about them and the categories that they use. So here I've got caring, positivity as a virtue, that's happiness but also flourishing, intelligence, and self-control. And mapping that on this, in this case, onto Buddhist virtues, seeing you know, which ones fit where and uh, which ones are left out of the picture is part of the project. And then the other part of the project is then to map it onto the, neuro, the emerging neuroscience. So there's a model of the five factors of personality, which is the dominant personality set of theories uh, in, in contemporary psychology. And each of these five factors uh, turn out to be relatively stable over the course of your life um, and uh, are about 50% genetically inheritable. Now, uh, they're probably, like everything else, are going to end up being determined by thousands of different genes. So I'm not suggesting that we're just going to find the one neuroticism gene and the one openness to experience gene. But these, uh, this, the fact that these are genetically inheritable and, and tend to be stable personality character traits over time does suggest that they will be amenable to the project of moral enhancement, that we will be able to find neurochemicals and, uh, and other ways of tweaking these settings uh, and making them modifiable. I also don't want to fall into the trap of the techno fix. Um, as Wendell, I agree with what Wendell Law and I actually often end up agreeing. It's a matter of tone between the two of us, me being the enthusiast and him being the cautious person. In this particular case, uh, I absolutely agree. We don't want to fall into a techno fix. Um, there are many uh, non technological ways to enhance virtue, but I'll mention more. Uh, one that is, that these are consistent throughout almost all of the virtues sleep. Diet and fasting, exercise and meditation seem to do things, good things in almost every virtue domain that you can look at. So just keep it in mind, if you're not getting enough sleep and you're eating like crap and you're not exercising, then just taking a pill probably won't get you as far as it would otherwise. So self-control. The basis of almost every moral code is various variations on self-control. Um, and there's a personality trait called conscientiousness. Um, and uh, it's one of the few uh, personality traits where there are very few downsides. Apparently, very high conscientious people tend to be a little boring. Uh, so if, you, if we had um, good control over our virtue uh, control panel, you might want to turn down your conscientiousness a little bit when you went out to party. But otherwise, in almost every domain of your life, you want to be as conscientious as possible. Um, and uh, the neurology of conscientiousness and attentiveness and self-control has a lot to do with executive function and variations of dopaminergic genes. So we know that dopaminergic gene variants are associated with things like infidelity, the likelihood of being uh, addicted to drugs, uh, being involved in the criminal justice system, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that there are things that uh, can uh, systematically appear to be beneficial in, uh, with self-control and, and attentiveness. Um, I'm increasingly interested in exploring wearables and self-quantification because um, I think that there are ways in which our kind of exocortex that we're surrounding ourselves with, our phones and our laptops and, and the kind of web of information around us, will be able to do things quicker and more f and faster and, and, and better than any attempt to tweak our neurology. But, you know, I'm interested in the tweaking neurology too, um, but uh, wearables uh, for me have certainly worked. I've been, you, you know, wearing a wearable for um, quantifying all my steps and calories and things like that, and it's helped me lose about 40 pounds over the last couple years. Um, but stimulant drugs are beneficial for this, um, and stimulant drugs, uh, I think it was Wendell, who was skeptical that there was anything that actually improves uh, uh, self-control. But if you actually, if you talk, I, I was 
diagnosed with ADD when I was a kid and took Ritalin. Um, and one of the things that you find when you talk to kids often who take Ritalin is that they are quite happy with their medicated self because it's like, yeah, I used to you know, hit, take a brick and hit my sister with it all the time and, and now I don't do that anymore and I don't get in trouble for that anymore. Uh, my life is a lot better now that I'm on this drug um, and that's because they're able, they're capable of exercising self-control and they're also capable of paying attention to their behavior. Uh, but we also have things that are more targeted towards other uh, weaknesses of self-control, ways of potentially overcoming drug addiction, um, uh, therapies and, and uh, vaccines for, that will prevent uh, drug addictions, hopefully safer drugs, drugs that are less addictive, although the cautionary history is that uh, morphine was invented, invented as a treatment for opium addiction and heroin was invented as a treatment for morphine addiction, so who knows if we're actually going to get safer drugs. Um, but ways of encouraging neurogenesis. One of the things that um, SSRIs appear to do which help people be, be less sad and, and which also help people break habits is by encouraging the growth of new uh, neurons. So if we can figure out ways to encourage neurogenesis, we might be able to um, exercise more self-control as well. Uh, the virtues of compassion, caring. Now again, we don't want just more compassionate people. We want them to be mature, moral, uh, character development, because just having more compassionate people might mean you have a bunch of people who are patsies and pushovers um, and, and don't exercise sufficient self-control. Um, but we're beginning to understand the uh, genetic uh, variants and the pathologies of emotional co empathy versus cognitive empathy, emotional empathy being how much you actually feel viscerally the pain of others when you see it or, or hear it. Uh, versus cognitive empathy, which is our capacity to, in a sophisticated way, predict the theory of mind of other people. So autists tend to be people who have cognitive empathy problems, uh, and psychopath, psychopaths tend to be people who have emotional empathy problems. And so unraveling some of the things that lead to that then suggests that we can go beyond therapy and enhance both of those at the same time. And that they're already maybe enhanced, maybe that part of uh, us being coming smarter, having more cognitive capacities over the last hundred years, um, is that is partly that we are also capable of taking on other people's points of view in a more sophisticated way. That we're exposed to so much more information than we used to be about uh, other people in the world that we don't always agree, but at least we can understand the points of view of others. Intelligence, I, I've struggled for a long time with whether to talk about wisdom, but wisdom is a very complicated term because wisdom in, in, uh, uh, pulls in emotive elements, it pulls in compassion, the way that people use it and so forth. I like intelligence, actually. Intelligence is something that we're increasingly understanding. I am a proponent of, uh, of G, of there being a uh, one factor of intelligence that can explain many things. Um, and our capacity, uh, the personality trait that is uh, often correlated with intelligence is openness to experience. Um, and, uh, you know, genes for intelligence appear to be in the thousands. So there's not going to be one gene tweak, and uh, drugs all do slightly different things. Modafinil does some things, and, and uh, you know, attention deficit drugs do other things. But I think we are on the path to figuring out how to enhance intelligence and of course the exocortical enhancement of intelligence and just having Google in your pocket makes you more intelligent in some ways. Um, so educate, you know, we know things, non-technological things enhance intelligence, education, bilingualism enhances intelligence, music, and it, it, it enhances intelligence both now and also gives you a cognitive reserve so that when you begin to lose your cognitive faculties later, that you lose them more slowly because your brain is kind of filled up with more good stuff later on. Um, delaying aging would help a lot. Uh, you know, just uh, figuring out how to slow down the aging processes that one of the other transhumanist goals would, would help a lot. Brain-machine interfaces. There's a lot of research now on transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation, uh, eventually nanoneural interfaces with the brain that would allow what Randall Cohn's doing to be done in real time and, and in a much more sophisticated way. The enhancement of fairness, uh, which again is not a virtue in all systems. This is an interesting case, I think, of why enlightenment virtues 
are different from pre-enlightenment virtues because fairness isn't always considered to be a virtue in all uh, systems. We, Corporate law was mentioned earlier, it does tend to reduce your racism, basically by working in the amygdala. A lot of the story about the virtue of fairness has to do with the relationship between the neocortex and the amygdala. The amygdala is basically where a lot of our innate uh, moral sentiments are coded. You know, two dudes kiss kissing, that grosses me out. That's the innate moral amygdala coming up. And then your neocortex has to decide what to do with that. Is your neocortex strong enough to tell your amygdala to shut up about that, or does it not tell it to shut up about that? What values is, are in the neocortex in the first place? So um, that conversation between the two is why people are more conservative when they're drunk than when they're sober. It's why people who are sleepy are more conservative than when they're alert. It's why people with higher IQs tend to be more liberal than uh, conservative. Uh, there is a, a political valence to uh, having a stronger neocortex versus a stronger amygdala. Uh, amygdalas that are twitchier. This is why conservatives tend to react more viscerally to stinky uh, smells or to uh, stickiness on their hands. You can make people more conservative if I put jelly on the door handle when you came in and you had jelly on your hands, you'd be more conservative than otherwise. And this has to do with this relationship. So obviously making people smarter will help make them a little bit fairer. But also, doing something about that, that twitchy amygdala seems to be important. It's key to uh, John Haidt's insights about the difference between liberal and conservative virtue. Conservatives tend to uh, see an innate moral valence to in-group loyalty, respect for authority, purity, and sanctity. Or as I like to say, these are monkey brain virtues. And the first one up there, harm and care, that liberals tend to care more about, that's don't push another monkey out of the tree. Fairness is share your bananas equally. In-group loyalty is uh, respect the tribe. Respect for authority is uh, respect the, the dominance hierarchy of your, of your troop. And purity and sanctity is uh, poo stinks, and, and that's why I'm going to throw it at you if we get an argument. Um, and those, you know, the reason that this, uh, this variant between liberal and conservatives works out this way is that basically you've got all the amygdala responses strong over here and the prefrontal cortex is not doing anything about it. But over here the liberals with their enlightenment uh, flavored prefrontal cortexes are saying, telling their amygdalas to shut up. Um, this suggests one of the things again that we can do for the religious is if, to the degree that we can convince them that the enlightenment values have this effect, um, we can try to get them to edge past some of their knee-jerk responses on things like gay marriage or immigration or whatever it is. <coughs> finally, uh, well not this is almost finally, mood, happiness, flourishing, this is an important part of the discussion, again, that the religious folks have pointed to for a while, the difference between a life of pleasure. You know, Mother Teresa may have never had a day of pleasure in her life, uh, but she at the end of her life, she felt like she had accomplished something. Uh, that's not exactly my idea of the good life. I think we need a little bit of pleasure, we need a little bit of accomplishment. But um, if you just watch TV all the time and take meth, you're probably, at the end of your life, not going to feel like you lived a great life. So we need uh, some balance of these two. And we're finding that there are gene variants that determine your likelihood of one versus the other. That about half of our capacity for happiness is genetically determined at birth. And that we tend to, you know, if you become a quadriplegic, you tend to, after six months, go back to your happiness set point. And if you win the lottery after six months, you tend to go back to your happiness set point. That's because these are determined partly in our brain. If we can figure out how, then we can start to tweak this the way that David Pierce wants. Then we also need to figure out how to tweak the flourishing uh, dynamic parts of our personality. So just to separate those, some of the things that folks have found helpful uh, in terms of flourishing is uh, marriage and participation in communities of meaning. So for instance, having kids is terrible for your hedonic happiness. As soon as you have kids, your hedonic happiness goes in the dump, and then as soon as they leave home, it goes back up again. But people who have kids, now this, I'm not uh, casting shade on anybody who makes another choice in life, but people who have kids tend to invest enough in that so at the end of their life they're happy that they had kids because they feel like it was an important accomplishment, right? So this is a part of that trade-off between some of these life choices, hedonic versus flourishing. Antidepressants and mood-elevating drugs may help us change our mood, but uh, we may need other things. There are genes that have been correlated with people's capacity for emotional resilience, for instance, uh, their ability to bounce back from bad experiences. The genes for self-control appear to uh, predict people's sense 
of life accomplishment, subjective well-being better than serotonin genes, which are more related to happiness and daily mood. And finally, this kind of broad catch-all category of transcendence, which is kind of the way I would summarize it is this, the virtue of being able to step out of our conditioned ways of looking at things and see things from a truly novel, creative perspective. So this is all about what Buddhism is trying to get you to do with the different kinds of meditation uh, experiences. Um, but we're beginning to find uh, some of the neurological correlates of this, that uh, tamping down the kind of uh, the dominant way that your brain works, the default mode network, figuring out how to interrupt that, how to redirect that uh, with drugs and other devices, seems to allow us to explore some of these states. Taking a magnet and focusing it on the part of your brain that um, maintains your sense of your body integrity. So you're, you, you're unconsciously you're thinking that my body ends here and the room's out there. I can tamp that down with a magnet. And when I do, suddenly you feel a sense of boundless oneness with the room. Now, that may be quite a transformative experience. One of the drugs that um, has been experimented with a lot uh, recently is psilocybin. Uh, people under clinical conditions who take psilocybin and uh, uh, an entheogen or a psychedelic drug um, have, had, have said it's one of the most meaningful experiences of their life, akin to having children, uh, getting married, and so forth. And uh, this is a brain on psilocybin on the right, and this is your brain before psilocybin. So basically it increases all this connectivity and communication in the brain. Um, and I think, uh, and I'm not saying everybody should take psychedelics, last time I did with a teenager, and, um, uh, but uh, it might be on some people's bucket list to, to give that a shot. Um, other kinds of things that can do it, uh, lucid dreaming. It turns out that uh, your capacity for lucid dreaming, so this is waking up in your dream and knowing that you're dreaming, uh, is directly related to self-control that you can exercise because it's uh, part of the executive function. It's your brain basically saying, I'm in control and I'm, I'm the observer here knowing what's happening. Uh, but you can practice lucid dreaming. You can improve your capacity for lucid dreaming. It's not something I've experimented with yet, but I'd like to. So all of these things together, I think, suggest that, uh, at least diagnostically, we could have an approach towards um, diagnosing our character flaws and, and understanding our path to perfection uh, a little bit more sophisticatedly than just saying that we have to pray on it or that um, you know, it's, it's fasting and, and meditation, that there are other things that we could do to work on particular character flaws and get to a, a more mature moral state. It's not just individual project, however. It's also a social project. We need to figure out how to have this conversation at a social level. Now, I'm, I'm an opponent of the drug war. I think it's caused way more harm than, it's, than, than good. But I am worried about uh, the proliferation in the future of drugs and devices which allow people to basically enslave themselves in increasingly sophisticated ways. We need to have a conversation beyond the, the, the knee-jerk libertarianism of the transhumanist movement, which says, if you want to lie in the gutter and be a heroin addict, go for it, um, where we say to one another, there is a better way to live, and you're not doing it, and we think you should. Now, whether we then follow that up with laws, prohibitions, that's a matter for debate. But I think we can have uh, a, a society that, that orients us towards flourishing as opposed to towards a static point of view. Conversely, we need to make sure that we don't end up doing what the Soviets did, which is to make every deviation of uh, psychology, or to make every political deviation uh, a psychiatric deviation. We don't want people to be diagnosed as racist and have to undergo you know, treatment uh, with oxytocin and psilocybin in their local mental health center, right? Racism probably should be something that people are allowed to have. We can encourage one another not to be racist, uh, we could suggest that they might want to go do these things, but I don't think we want to make it a political crime. Um, we don't want to end up with Sisyphus drugs. You know, here's one of the classic um, uh, moral questions. Sisyphus having a miserable time pushing that rock up the hill, keeps rolling back down. What if we just gave him a drug where he's happy to do that? You know? uh, just change his moral psychology, give him a little uh, uh, provincial, a little uh, uh, Adderall, and uh, suddenly he's happy being Sisyphus. Uh, we have to be able to, we don't, that's the problem with SOMA, we don't want to live in a world in which 
all of our legitimate grievances with our domestic and, and political situation are driven away by drugs. So there's a lot of political questions around cognitive liberty that we have to deal with. So, in summary, I think there are benefits for the religious, there are benefits for transhumanists, and cosmism as one example of this dialogue, I think, could really benefit from looking at moral enhancement as one area. So far as I could tell, the aspirations, the moral improvement aspirations of the Russian cosmists were pretty vague about you know, technology eventually leading to moral improvement of humanity. This might give a little bit more meat to those bones. And so finally, transhumanism is basically religious aspirations plus the Enlightenment. Uh, transhumanism does not preclude religiosity. In fact, uh, they're religious transhumanists of all stripes. Transhumanism should embrace this dialogue. It's an inescapable dialogue to have. And I think moral enhancement is one place it needs to be had. Thank you very much. behavior with profound nutritional assessment, which should be part of the I, whole... I completely agree. Yeah. And that, that's why I put the slide in, you know, sleep, diet, exercise, and meditation. Nutrition. They're good across the board on these things. Okay. I wonder why you did not say, it said, you did not say anything about plastics. Plastics? Yes. It's already known that they mean it is it's estrogen. estrogen. Yeah. And so in Western civilization, we see that um, uh, aggressiveness of man is much lower than in, in societies where they use less plastic. For example, here we women are even allowed to talk. You see, in some civilizations, in some uh, societies, they not allowed to talk. That's because so, of plastics? No. I, what I'm saying is that if it's lower testosterone in, in Western oh, oh, civilization, it's uh, more peaceful, less aggressive man. Could you... Is this a Russian idea about why Americans are no, it's so not, feminized? No, it's not. It's not. I'm just, I'm just, it's my personal thing that, my personal uh, thought that probably plastic Play at all. What do you Absolutely. Mean? Pseudoestrogens have been well documented to be linked to the yes. spread of endocrine disorders and to, in particular, the malformations of uh, the genitals of uh, certain animals and probably the rise in. Uh, so, are you for plastics? High phagospadias in men. Yeah. Um, for my four plastics? <laughs> I think, I think there see, appear to be more and less dangerous plastics, and there are more and less dangerous things you can do with plastics in terms of what kinds of food you can keep in them. So I have become increasingly cautious around it. Um, so uh, yes, hypospadias in men is, is uh, threefold compared to what it used to be, and that's partly related to that. I don't think that there are many behavioral changes related to plastics that I've been able to see, that I've been able to read about. But, um, certainly, are, we're surrounded by thousands of chemicals which have been unstudied, especially in their interaction effects. Um, and many of them probably do have behavioral consequences. Yvonne? I think it's very interesting because I wonder where all, a lot of our basic teachings have come from. You know, all of the religions we had some beings that came and, you know, the Hinduism and the Chinese. <coughs>
So I was raised Unitarian, who, and Unitarians basically think that um, you know, the moral code can be distilled and can be common to all religions. And then when I became more mystic, um, I uh, gravitated towards that kind of mysticism as well, the Baba Ram Das, you know, that everything basically boils down to transcending the self or whatever. I'm less, uh, I'm more deconstructive than that these days. I think um, there's probably a lot of different sources of these things, uh, cultural evolution and genetic. Uh, you know, the, there seems to be religiosity itself. So, so openness to experience, for instance. People who have higher openness to experience tend to be more easily hypnotizable and are more open to uh, mystical experiences, and less openness to experience tends to make you more fundamentalist. Um, now, why there are why is there a variation of this after all these? millions of years of evolution, it's probably because it's to some uh, advantage for a society to have a little bit of the one and a little bit of the other, some balance in its, in, in its population. Um, and I don't think we understand that well enough, but does that suggest anything about a common source of religion when you have these two very different things happening and it's both called religion? I don't, I don't think so. So I, I think I'm a little bit more deconstructive and suspicious of the idea of commonalities at this point. James, thank you very much.